Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people. This is ABC News Daily. The recent budget predicted our power bills will rise by 20% this year and another 30% next year. It's a massive increase, but spare a thought for the people of Europe, where they've already seen electricity and gas bills soar by up to 80%. Today, energy and Russian foreign policy expert Emily Holland on the miserable winter ahead in the Northern Hemisphere. Emily, I don't know about you, but for me, a lukewarm shower in the middle of winter doesn't sound that appealing. (laughs) But that is what the French are being told to do. Have a cold shower to save energy. Well, the message from, from Paris is one of energy sobriety. You can see that the the leadership in Paris are really taking this to heart. They have switched over to wearing turtlenecks under their jackets instead of uh, a suit and tie. They say this keeps people warmer and will reduce the need to keep their thermostats high. And, And, you know, they're turning off public monuments and... This is really happening sort of all over Europe, at least in Western Europe. States are saying, you know, we have to sort of make sacrifices uh, in the face of a really severe energy crisis that is following from Russia's war in Ukraine. Around Europe, countries are looking for ways to cut energy consumption and fill up their gas stores. Germany's government has agreed measures to save energy this winter that may leave buildings cooler and streets Measures that could force energy intensive industries to shut at peak times people are are starting to get this message. Mm, I see the Eiffel Tower will stop shining at 11.45 instead of 1am, just another way to save some energy. In Italy too, I see that the central heating will be restricted. And in the UK, there's that talk of forced blackouts. What would that mean? What would that look like? Well, this will probably happen um, probably across a bunch of economies in Europe. Mm. And what it probably means for for most citizens, for citizens is not that much, but will really affect industry. So we're going to see energy intensive industries, um, manufacturing, like in fertilizers or chemicals, they will probably have to ration energy. That means they probably won't be able to produce every day of the week. Mm. So they're going to have to sort of cut production. And that, of course, has an effect on on people's jobs, right? If they're not producing, then they're not selling as much and will be able to be able to keep their entire staffs on. Mm. And then of course for people, you know, energy bills are going to be really high for all consumers. So they're going to have to turn their thermostats down. They're going to have to be more conscious of turning on the lights or turning off the lights when they're leaving the room. Just all the sort of things that, you know, we 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 take it we take for granted in terms of having all the power on in our house, you know, all the heat, everything. Like that's just really going to have to change this winter. Mm, seeing people are also sort of stockpiling thermals and gloves and dressing gowns, torches and generators. It's It does seem unbelievable, doesn't it, in 2022 that we're having to do this sort of thing. We know the war in Ukraine has played a big part in that, but unpack that for me. So basically, uh, for for many years, Europe got its energy, a lot of it from from Russia. Um, Over a third of its natural gas came from Russia, uh, about 40 percent of its oil and about 40 percent of its coal all came from Russia. And all of those things were used to generate electricity. However, once Putin decided to invade Ukraine, uh, for the first time, European countries said, "Okay, we're going to sanction Russian energy because obviously buying Russian energy sends a lot of money to the Kremlin, right, to fund their war effort. So Europe said, we are going to break this relationship. We are not going to buy Russian energy anymore. As we speak, Europe is concluding new arrangements with reliable, trustworthy suppliers all over the world. First oil, then coal, and and now, in some senses, natural gas. So that's fine, but the problem is, when you stop buying Russian commodities, that means you have to buy it somewhere else. So that has just pushed the prices of all those commodities really high because basically now everybody's scrambling to buy up sort of every last drop of Russian energy. 
it's pretty easy to say buy other volumes of oil because you know oil is shipped on tankers throughout the world so it's pretty fungible it's, it's pretty pretty um flexible but natural gas comes in pipelines mm. from russia so finding that is really difficult they've had to turn to what's called liquefied natural gas which is more expensive and globally traded so they're kind of buying up other supplies that other states would have normally bought by outbidding them and so that is sort of driving the cost higher and higher and it's sort of changing global flows of energy really dramatically so it's causing this more or less huge global energy crisis and sort of changing who buys from whom and it's just a huge energy disruption You mentioned the pipelines. There is a, a major pipeline, isn't there, between Russia and Germany? And that's been a real focus point of this war. Absolutely. So Nord Stream Pipeline is probably the most famous pipeline in the world. It should have its own publicist. Mm -hmm. It was a pipeline that uh, directly connected Russia to Germany with natural gas. There were three explosions mm. that sort of tore through the pipelines and rendered basically three of them unusable. As we go to air this morning, gas is spewing out under the Baltic Sea after two of Europe's most... Uh, seismologists in Sweden say they detected what could have potentially been explosions. Countries like Denmark, Norway and Poland say that this does look deliberate. And there is a huge effort right now to sort of figure out who did it, what happened. It was a clearly an act of sabotage. Uh, there's no evidence to show kind of who did it at this point, but people have a lot of suspicions. Mm, some people think it was Russia, but it seems strange that they would do that given that they earn a lot of money from that pipeline. So why would they blow it up? Well, it's a it's a it's a huge question. So so some people think that, you know, Russia blew up this pipeline as a, as a message to say, OK, Europe, you know, you're in this energy crisis already. You know what? Your energy infrastructure is 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 vulnerable. Uh, we could blow up other energy infrastructure. We could make it have so that you are having a disastrously cold winter, right? We could blow up other pipelines. We could blow up LNG terminals. So it could be a signal. You know, it could be sort of a trick for Russia to sort of threaten Europe and say, we still have power over you. Um, but the Russians are denying this. You know, they're blaming the U.S. They say, look who benefits from this energy crisis, it's the U.S. It's clear who's behind all of that and who profits from it. It is indeed now possible to force European countries into buying greater quantities of liquefied natural gas from the United States. U.S. LNG prices are much higher. So, you know, there's all kinds of, 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 of accusations surrounding this pipeline. And we probably won't ever have definitive evidence as to who actually blew up the pipeline. Mm, and if Russia doesn't sell its gas to Europe, then where will its gas likely end up? Well, it's going to go to China. Mm. Um, you know, the, Russia's war in Ukraine and, and the subsequent energy divorce has really just accelerated a trend that we were already seeing prior to the war, which was Russia turning to China to sell its commodities. Uh, it inaugurated a huge pipeline called the Power of Siberia, uh, which sent Russian gas to China about a few years ago. And it's just been doubling and tripling capacity, uh, you know, ever since. And, and since the war started, it became the Russia became the number one supplier of, of oil products, crude oil to China, uh, supplanting Saudi Arabia for the first time. So it's really just accelerating this trend of Russia being forced to turn to Asian markets to to sell its commodities. And, and I'm sure we're going to see Russia and China working more closely together in the energy sector in the near future. And this global energy crisis, what will it mean for countries outside of Europe, countries like Australia? Well, I mean, what it what it means is that, you know, even though it's only it's Europe that's in this main energy crisis, they're trying to buy up every last drop of non-Russian energy. So that means that globally prices are higher. So uh, for poor countries in Asia like Sri Lanka and Pakistan, they can no longer afford to buy the energy the supplies that they need. They simply can't afford it. Prices are too high. So this is causing serious energy crisis in Asian markets as well. Now, for, for countries like Australia, this is just a dramatic redrawing of where energy goes around the world. So this is not something that's going to change in the near future. It basically means now that Russia is reorienting its energy trade towards towards Asia. And so there's going to be more competition 
to sort of sell commodities in Asia. And Australia is an energy exporter, as you know, uh, particularly to Asian markets. So they're going to be there's going to be more competition now. There's more Russian energy coming in. Where will Australia sell their energy to? Will they also sell it to China? Will this mean that they will get less for selling their their commodities to Asian markets, or will it mean that now just competition for every bit of energy is so much higher? that now prices will be elevated. It's just a huge fundamental shift in all energy markets, and it really reaches all over the world. And Emily, can Europe get through this winter, get through winter without reverting to thermal wear and hot water bottles, do you think? You know, if the weather remains pretty warm, yeah, they'll be okay. They've filled up their storage uh, tanks even higher than they had originally thought. So, It will probably be okay this winter, but that's keeping in mind that they'll need to be a demand reduction. So to get through the winter, they'll need to cut about 15 to 20 percent of demand, which is really significant if you think about it. So all of those things like keeping your thermostat down, turning all the lights off, that's going to be a reality in Europe, not only for this year, but for the next few years as well. So it's something that Europe will have to get used to. People are going to have to revert to things like burning wood you know, sort of taking you back to a time when en- energy was not so cheap and plentiful. And I think that's sort of the, the biggest lesson out of out of this uh, situation is that, you know, we are entering a period in which energy is no longer as cheap or as plentiful as it was prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And we're probably going to be in that world for the next five to 10 years. Dr. Emily Holland is an assistant professor at the Russia Maritime Studies Institute at the US Naval War College. European leaders have been considering whether to introduce a price cap on imported gas to reduce energy prices. This episode was produced by Flint Duxfield and Chris Dengate, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer this week is Sydney Pete. I'm Sam Hawley. ABC News Daily will be back again tomorrow. You can find all our episodes of the podcast on the ABC Listen app. To get in touch with the team, email us on abcnewsdaily at abc.net.au. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.